that tower on that, that church steeple that you saw there, when we first went there, the preacher had the van parked where we usually parked. And so we parked under that steeple. And uh, I'm talking about literally thousands of bees locked us in our camper. We could not get out of our camper. I mean, it just covered us. I mean, we're talking two or three inches thick. And uh, so we called the preacher and said, Preacher, uh, what do we do with these bees? He said, don't worry about it. About 4 o'clock, they'll all go back inside the church and go to sleep. <laughs> so we waited, and, and uh, they did. About 4 o'clock, they decided to go back in. And uh, so I told the preacher after church that night, I said, I'm moving my camper. Get your van out of my road. Moved his van, and I moved my camper over where I usually park. And the next night, the lightning struck that steeple, and the tiles of the roof of that thing were about yay long and about yay thick that come off that steeple and crushed a car that was sitting there where my camper was. Uh, God helped us. Now, the little girl that lost her car <laughs> wasn't too happy. Uh, she was one of them fly-by-nighters anyhow, you know, claimed to be saved, lived like the devil. And uh, when she came out and saw her, I mean, it was, her roof was crushed clean to her steering wheel. I mean, it was crushed. She said, what'd you do to my car? I said, I do nothing, dear. That's just, <clears throat> you ought to get right with God. It'll help you to get it. <laughs> Amen. But just a few days before that was our birthday. June 20th is our birthday. We'll be 47 next June 20th. 47 years saved, and uh, I was praying that day and asking God to, to let me, if he could, witness to more people than I ever had before, put me back in the streets more, give me more revival meetings, give me something. God, I want to tell more people about Jesus, and on that Tuesday night, right and instruct the church, and NBC called and said, we want a live interview with you. And I said, I'm in Ohio. I ain't coming to New York. They said, no, we're sending the trucks and the cameras to you. And so they came the next morning, which was the 4th of July. And uh, the guy walked me over to the camera. I was trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. I've never been on TV. I preach against TVs. <laughs> and uh, he said, have you ever been on there before? I said, no, sir. I preach against them wicked things. He said, you better not do that this morning. He said, you're on the Today Show. <laughs> and uh, so I said, what I do? He said, all you got to do is look in the hole right there, the, the, the camera thing. Just look right there and just uh, be honest. Now, I'm telling you, I'm about half deep. I can't hear good. I, I almost crammed that full thing half in my brain to make sure that what Matt Lauer said I got a hold of. I did not want to be made a fool of on national TV. I thought, oh, dear God, if I don't hear him right and I say something stupid, I'm going to be a real mess. <laughs> so I made sure that I heard every word he said on, on purpose and then answered, you've seen how I answered the best I could. Amen. The Holy Ghost said, don't worry about what you've got to say, I'll tell you. And that's what happened. Amen. You've seen what happened. After he was done, uh, in my ear, a little girl come on and she said, uh, Mr. Hardman, I sure would like to thank you for your morning and the time and on and on. And I said, who are you? She said, I'm the producer of the Today Show. I said, oh, okay, good. I said, you got five minutes? She said, for what? I said, I need five minutes of your time. She said, well, I said, no, 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 no. You've took 15, 20 minutes of mine. I want five of yours. She said, okay. I told her about Jesus. When she got done, she disappeared and this other little voice come on and I said who are you she said I'm the co-producer uh, she said you wanted to talk to me I said yeah I sure do so I gave her five minutes and while me and the deacon was taking the tower down so it didn't fall on no more cars around there uh, the BBC called uh, Paul Harvey called uh, Pittsburgh Gazette called, I don't know how many newspapers, it's in, it's in the book back there, 
Uh, the BBC broadcast went all over Europe, Africa, Australia. The Matt Lauer interview went all over America and Canada. Uh, she said eight million people watched that interview on the Today Show. The BBC producer, after I witnessed to him, said he'd, he don't know how many millions watched the BBC broadcast. And so I said, God, I sure would like to witness to more people this year than I ever had before. <laughs> Every minute on a Today Show is a million dollars. I had five minutes and seven seconds free to tell them that Jesus Christ is God and he can do what he pleases. Wasn't long after that, old Matt Lauer got his tail in a ringer and got himself in trouble, got booted out of the place, amen. I sure hope he gets saved. But that's the story of the Lightning Bolt Church. I'm ahead of there. Now, we don't have the church no more. They sold it. It fell in around them. They ain't but three or four people there. So they combined with another three or four people church, and I think there's out to 20 now. But, but anyhow, that's, that's how that all came to pass. Now, listen, when things like that happen, uh, we'd be sitting in restaurants, and little waitress come and said, did I see you on TV the other morning? I said, yeah, you sure did. She said, are you famous? I said, no, no. <laughs> My poor old grandma was in West Virginia sitting in her chair. She always watches the Today Show. When he said Don Hardman, she looked at him and she said, that's my Don Hardman. <laughs> she told the woman that stayed with her, uh, get in here and watch my grandson. Best preacher in the country. Get in here and watch him. All I'm saying is, gang, all that so-called famous stuff for God won't put a biscuit on your table or a dollar in your pocket. You got to be a politicker or a sports hero to get money. But to serve God Almighty, our reward is not down here. Our reward is at home. Amen. Shoveling it up to God. God, keep this for me. I'm fixing to come. <laughs> Hold this for me, God. I'm on my way. And we put all of our treasures on the yawn side where rust and moth does not corrupt. Amen. Amen. Right. But it was a great opportunity and, and probably a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I even made Hollywood Squares. You ever remember that old stupid show? Yeah. What was the preacher preaching on in Ohio when the lightning struck the church? <laughs> I'm telling you, gang. It was something. It was something. All right, that's enough of that stuff, okay? <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2, my family, the 14th message on vessels. 14th message. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm glad to see all of you. Glad to see my Fredonia family here tonight. Thank God for them. Amen. Praise the Lord. They're adding to our family. Amen. Little Monica's with child. Hallelujah. And we're going to give us a new baby to look at after a while. I remember when she was no bigger than an oven. I've been going around her long enough, and now she's having babies. Hallelujah. So what a great blessing. We'll be down there in just a little while. Won't be long. We'll be at their church having a big time. And praise God for that. Her pastor got saved after listening to one of the messages at the camp meeting. Dan Mara got saved. Dale Mara got saved after listening to one of the messages at the camp meeting. That Hamburg camp meeting has got a lot of fruit, and I praise the good Lord for it. Y'all be able to stand with me? Are you able to stand? Let me read you these three verses one more time. One more time, all right? One more time. Pre play down at King Ferry. The night, night services start at 630, okay, because there's two of us preaching every service, and so they start at 630 down there. By the way, did, do you remember to pray for the preacher at noon today? Good. Keep doing it every day at noon, every day at noon, every day at noon, all right? You don't have to pray out loud, but you better pray and ask God to help him, give him wisdom and skill. I think he's meeting with somebody next week. Is that right? Somebody you're meeting with? The engineer on the property. The engineer he's meeting next week. That noon prayer is going to become important now. Amen. Stay at it. Stay with it, my love, okay? Stay with it. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. 
Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, and I've been working on you for days, have I not, to get you to become an honorable vessel, and some to dishonor. There's always that bunch. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. And that's what we want to be. Sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. You and I, my dear family, need to, uh, we, had an old, we had an old fella uh, down, in, down in Louisiana in, in the streets. And he was uh, in his 70s. And, but he was uh, strong as a 20-year-old. i never seen a lot in my life. I mean, you squeeze his arm and it didn't give. I mean, it's like squeezing steel. And he, he'd ride his bike all over the town and, and do this, that, and the other. And, and he'd come down there to eat. Mom would fix him some food, and he'd listen to the preaching. And he'd, tighten, he'd tell all them boys around there, he said, y'all need to tighten up. They'd be over there doing what? Tighten up. You tighten up. Well, dear church, you and I need to tighten up. We're on our way to the judgment seat of Christ. We're on our way to meet our maker. We're on our way to rejoice and praise his holy name for what he's done for us. But before we get to rejoice, we got to face the judge. Do you hear me? The blessed part about it for us that are saved is our judge is our savior. For you loved ones in this room and on the air that are not born again, your maker is your judge only. Even though he's the Savior of all men. Everything that he did, he did 2,000 years ago to save everybody there is. But man won't accept that. And so he throws away the greatest gift ever given. Jesus Christ and eternal salvation. I want to look tonight, if I may, at the, at the, uh, uh, the last, I guess, message on this series. And I want to bring you a thought tonight about this honorable vessel that we should be, being a controlled vessel. You know the world's out of control. I mean, America's going down to flames. It's just sad. But you and I aren't. We're controlled by someone who knows what to do. I want to bring that thought to you tonight, if I may, just for a few minutes. Could you let me do that? All right. The men have prayed. Brother Williams prayed for me. All right, we're ready to go. You may be seated, dear family. I want you to go with me now the Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, dear family, I know you believe this, but we could, we could just go just about anywhere with this thought. There's four vessels on that board right there. And there's two categories in all four vessels. It don't matter which one of the four vessels you are, okay? What matters is, are you honorable? That's what matters. You cannot be honorable if you're out of control. If your main influence in life is the world or somebody and it's not God Almighty, you're not going to be an honorable vessel. Now let me say this to you. Now look at me, look at me, look at me. Per circumstance, you need to make up your mind what you're going to be. You can't get up in the morning and say, God, I'm going to be an honorable vessel all day long and head out the door. Uh, every circumstance needs your attention. We can't coast through life. Believe it or not, our lives are deliberate. We deliberately do what we do. You deliberately get up and go to work in the morning. You deliberately clean the house and wash the clothes, Mama. You deliberately go to school, children. You deliberately do many, many things during your day. And each deliberate act of the person needs to be controlled. And you are controlled by somebody. For... 
20-some years, I can't say in my babyhood, but for 20-some years for sure, okay, I was controlled by the devil. I was of my father the devil. That's where all lost people are. They are of their father the devil, and the lusts of their father they will do. That's what the Bible says. He said, preach what are you trying to tell me? For years and years and years, he said, and I did. Simple as that. He controlled me. Now, we got this dumb idea, us men especially got it, that, you know, we're self-made men and we've done what we pleased all our life and nobody's telling me what to do when all along the devil's been doing it. Us proud peacocks ain't too smart. And girls are the same way, don't you? You ain't getting off the hook, girls. You, you've done the same thing, uh, maybe not to the extent that we have, but, but many have done the same thing, thinking they're their own way, uh, especially those who, who finally get out from underneath the daddy's thumb. Got out in their own apartment, got out in their own workforce, whatever it is, and I know some girls got to work, I understand all that, but I'm just trying to get you to understand something. There's something strange happens to people once they get out from under parental authority. Something strange happens to them. The pride gets pumped up. The pride then starts to get outside, and that's the arrogance of people. They start to believe that they can handle this, handle that. And the things they cannot handle, they endeavor to cover up. That's why I was a drunk before I got saved. I endeavored to cover up what I in my arrogance said I was handling, but in my reality it was killing me. And I couldn't deal with it. So I tried to bury it in a brown bottle. Every time I got to the bottom of a brown bottle, I was no better than I was before I started from the cap of that brown bottle. Anybody idea on that? Older men. So, what I'm trying to say, I'm just trying to get you to understand something. You're going to be controlled somehow, some way, and you better pick and choose who you want to control you. And you can't flip flop. All right, one of the things that's killing our churches is the flip flops. They're so pious on Sunday and so full of mischief on Wednesday. You say, preacher, what, what's wrong with them? They, they don't know who they belong to. They can't figure out what to do with themselves. So they pretend. And one day after a while, the pretense wears off. And once the pretense wears off on these dear people, and they are dear people, they're somebody's daughter, somebody's son, somebody's mama, somebody's daddy, somebody's grandpa, somebody's uncle, somebody's aunt. They're somebody's dear one. But yet they don't understand that in their so-called uncontrolled state, they're actually being manipulated. Listen, we don't war against flesh and blood, but against spirits and higher powers, and all kinds of junk that's going on. And unless you get some discernment about you, you're going to always think it's the person that's doing that and not the spirit that's in them, the attitude that's in them. In the streets. We was there one day in New Orleans, and New Orleans is one bad place. I don't go there, okay? Just don't go there. And And... and this girl got in there and she, she started rattling off at the mouth. And I walked over to her and I said, shut your mouth. You ain't talking to Jesus like that. She was, and Lucian came over, my helper. He said, is that how you stop that? I said, sure he is. I said, they're not in control. He said, preacher, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you, gang, that voice was not her. It was what was in her. Christ is our power. The blood of Jesus Christ is for sin. The name of Jesus Christ is to combat the forces of evil that's all around us. You watch your Bible. 
You look at how Jesus Christ dealt with people, and you'll find out by their family that that name, which is above every name, Amen. even Satan can't stand the name. Yeah. And when you use the name of Jesus in the proper text, you're victorious. Amen. Even on yourself. First Thessalonians chapter 4 says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Number one, my family, you and I need to be a controlled vessel so that we can walk and please God. That simply means live and please God. That simply means function and please God. That means work and please God. That means come to church and please God. That means raise your family and please God. That means have a good marriage and please God. No matter where you want to go with it, that's what it means. And all of it's to please God. You say, preacher, how can you do that? you got to get yourself in control. You've got to get that word of God buried down in your heart that you not sin against God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You're talking to God Almighty. When that word of God, listen, love, listen, when something rises up in your life, a verse ought to get right between you and it. You ought to be able to look at that verse instead of the problem and say, God in heaven, I want you to help me now. I want to use this verse. And when you use that verse, my dear ones, whatever the problem is, has to go away. It can't stand the Bible. Whatever the problem is. Now you say, preacher, I've been in some problems and they did not go away. Well, how about the time when God Almighty walked you through it? How about the time when God Almighty carried you through when you could not walk through it? Some of us have had cancer. I've had two or three of them now, okay? A little on my ear, that wasn't much. But these guts was bad. And then lymph nodes, the first batch was really bad. And I could not go through it. I could not muster up enough. Now, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just going to tell myself, ready? I'm a man of God, okay? But when your mind can't think and you can't remember, you can't half see, and medicine's working in your brain. I could not, could not carry it myself. Folks are praying for me all over the country. I thank God for that. Folks are sending money from all over everywhere to pay my bills. But physically, mentally, emotionally, I could not handle it. Couldn't handle it. He said, preacher, but you're a tough man. I know. I'm a hard man. <laughs> Literally. Amen. He said, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you, though, how I ought to walk wasn't coming. But the pleasing God I worked on. Let me say it again. You didn't get it. The walk was not coming. So because I could not walk, live, go, Function, be, think. I just focused on pleasing God somehow. Are you listening? You said, preacher, what good did it do you? It put me in control of what was happening to my life. Even though cancer was eating my lunch. Even though chemo was eating it worse. I controlled my reaction and my response and my relationship with God. I controlled it. I went to God. I laid with God. I, 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 I prayed to God. I sought God's face. I, I, I hungered for God. I, I, I bet when Mama read me the Bible, I had no clue what she was even saying half the time, but it didn't matter. I was trying my best to soak God and, and get a hold of God and get around God and be with God. Why? Because that's the only control I had. I, I disciplined myself. And a controlled vessel does that. A controlled vessel, my dear family, how you ought to walk and to please God so that you would bound more and more. Why are you like that, sir? 
Because I'm saved and I'm going home. You're not going home. You're sick. You, 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 you're in bad shape. You, 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 they told us you ain't even going to make it. I said, oh, but I am. I'm going home with Mama or I'm going home with Jesus. I'm going home. It's okay. You say, preacher, that's kind of... No, 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 no. That was a control. The only control I had was an attitude. You do know that 90% of your healing's in your attitude, don't you? Was it not the Apostle Paul that said, Hey, Agrippa, I think myself happy. Well, when you're sick, you can think yourself okay, even though you're so sick you can't stand it. Because this was still okay. This was still right. This was still holy. This was still pure. This was still happening. Listen to that. My fellowship with my God was still going strong, even though my fellowship and relationship with everything else was dead. Control. Being in charge of at least your attitude. I want you to look with me, please, in Galatians chapter 1. The apostle Paul, he had some problems with some folks over there because of the spiritual influence. I could ask you, dear people, about your spiritual influence. Who do you look to for your spiritual ideas? Who do you look to, my dear family? Who, who is it that, that, that teaches you and I uh, the ways of God, if you will, please? I remember when me and Mama first got saved. We went to West Virginia to see McKin folk and my old granddaddy. He's, you know, he's tobacco chewer and cigarette smoker and all that kind of stuff, you know. We just fresh saved, didn't know nothing. And I said, Granddaddy, I said, is it a sin to smoke? So Perch, what did you say? He didn't say it was. But the Holy Ghost did. See, there are some folks that will give you what they know. Now, you got to understand something. You, are you with me? Stay with me now. If those that you ask for advice from are no more spiritual than you are, you're going to get to hear what you want. Well, you know, so-and-so, he, he, he rubs snuff. I reckon it's okay. It won't give you lung cancer. Uh, <coughs> excuse me? God Almighty says don't defile the temple of God. God says. And a lot of times we, we search for those who are similar to us to get our spiritual influence. Watch, watch your Bible. Verse, uh, uh, Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. The Bible says, He's Lord, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father? To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now Paul's looking at this church he started there and he says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul said to that church, Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Spiritual what trying to tell me. I'm trying to get you to understand something. That Galatian church started out pretty good, but then some evil influences started coming in there, and the unlearned did not know how to handle or control what they were taking in. Listen, my dear family. Listen, my close. Ready, 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 ready? You do not need to focus on the wrong to learn the wrong. You lived wrong thought wrong, dressed wrong, ate wrong, your whole lost life. When you get saved by the grace of God, you were changed from the inside out. You're still working on making this here look like it's inside. You're still battling flesh against the spirit, spirit against the flesh. Every one of us are. But my dear family, listen to me right now. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You get around a liberal, you're going to be a liberal. You get around a modernist, you're going to be a modernist. If they can continue the fire and continue to burn you just a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, that's the way of the political world. What they do is they tell a lie to the unlearned so long that they now believe it's the truth. That's what the politicers do. 
He said, preacher, what do I do? Learn the truth. Amen. Don't let truth fall in the street. Get a hold of the truth of the Word of God. Preacher, I, I was reading a passage of Scripture and I don't understand what it means. Brother Fenton will tell you exactly what it means. By context. Okay? Don't just take it on yourself. Okay, I know what Jesus wept means because you may not. And some will come up and say, well, I just mentioned Jesus was emotionally messed up that day. No, he wasn't. Okay? When your influence is around you and you're not controlling it properly, there's only one way to figure out what's right or wrong. By that which is right. There's only one way to understand the wrong, and that's to know the right. In order to know the right, you've got to be in the right. In order to understand the right, you've got to be in the right and study the right. Study to show yourself approved unto God. You've got to be in that thing, or learning and, and, and receiving it into your spirit. Not just in your eyes for five minutes in the morning. You need to bring it into your spirit all the way to the marrow of your bones so that it can grow out this way from you. Paul had a problem at Galatians church. Look at 3.1. Galatians 3.1 with me. Stay with me. Galatians 3.1. This is what the Bible says. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you? Not what? Who? People. Things, my dear family, don't influence near as much as people do. Family, friends, or foes. you got to watch. you got to discern. you got to figure out. Are they telling me the truth? Or are they telling me an old wives' tale? Are they telling me the truth? Or are they telling me their opinion? Many a time, uh, in the streets especially, uh, I'd have somebody come up to me and say, what about this? I said, well, what do you think? And they'd tell me what they think. I said, you got a Bible verse for that? Well, no, that's just what my mama says. I said, well, let me show what the Bible says. I had a guy one time down in New Orleans on Canal Street, and, and he was up one side of me and down the other. Bless his heart, he wouldn't get away from me to save my life. I finally got sick of him, and so I started preaching. I just passed out tracks. I just started preaching. He got right in my face, right there. I never even stopped walking. Hey, Brother James, I never stopped walking. I'm preaching and spitting and preaching and spitting and preaching and spitting and walking. And he said, what did he do? He back it up, back it up, getting soaking wet. Finally, he asked me a question. He said, have you ever had the second blessing? I said, sir, I don't even remember when it was. My God has blessed me so much since he saved me by the grace of God. His wife's tugging on his coat, trying to get him away from me. He said, preacher, what are you trying to tell me? You and I, please don't take this wrong, are literally powerless without God. Amen. Jesus Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. And so often we try to, in our pride and arrogance, we try to do that. Paul told that crowd over there, he said, Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who has turned you away that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently sent forth crucified among you? Who is it that did that? Chapter 4, verse 9. But now that after you've known God, or rather known of God, and here's, here's where we all coming in. But now after you've known God, or rather have known of God, Church, you've been around 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You've served God and slowed down or cooled down. How turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements where until you desire again to be in bondage? You've observed days and months, times and years. Paul said to that church, I am afraid of you. And a lot of times our pastors are struggling. Because it's the wildest thing in all the world. Somebody be with you 5, 10, 15 years and all of a sudden they turn sour. All of a sudden they're skipping church. All of a sudden they're, they're bad All of a sudden they're sowing discord. They're in that Galatians text right there. Somebody's influencing them. It may be a physical somebody or it may be a spirit somebody. And it drives people, it drives pastors crazy. 
And it hurts them so bad when somebody they've loved and cared for and, and taken care of and watched over and led and, and, and trained turns against them. See, my dear family, what happened was they got out of control. Look on in your Bible, please, in Thessalonians 4. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. Every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Here's where the principle came from I thought. Possess his vessel. Control his vessel. Guard his vessel. Watch his vessel in sanctification, separated for sacred use, and honor our word on the board. See, my dear family, you and I are not our own. 1 Corinthians 6 declares that. You and I are not our own. We're bought with a price. We belong to God Almighty. Ain't that right? Come on now. We belong to God Almighty. Ain't that right? Now, your youngins belong to you, don't they? You ain't going to let some cowboy come in the door there and take your youngins out of your house, are you? They're your youngins, right? Same way with your wife. Same way with your husband. You ain't going to let some cowboy come through there and grab your young wife or your husband and get on out. No, 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 no. You belong to somebody. You and I that are saved by the grace of God belong to God. Amen. We're bought with a price. It was a high price. And what we got to do, my dear time, is we got to figure out how are we going to control when God owns me, how do I control myself? Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me start you out about verse 3. Let's see what we do. You ready? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Hang on. It ain't but 4 after 8. We're still doing good. God's Bible says these words, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 6. Give no offense in anything. Now, in order for me not to give offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, I've got to control my vessel. I've got to possess my vessel. I've got to watch over my vessel. And the hardest thing in all the world for us Baptists to do, we can make this mind. We have a hard time with these. Hello, fellas. You got red blood in your veins? We have a hard time with these. But our biggest problem is not that. Our biggest problem is that. God Almighty says, Give no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. See, the most important thing in our lives as Christians is the cause of Christ. I've been popping on that two weeks now. To guard the cause of Christ. To guard that the enemy of our soul will not cause us to cause damage to the cause of Christ. To the church of the living God. To the brethren. Amen. You and I need to protect one another. Amen. If somebody jumps in your face, you need to jump back. Amen. And say, listen, hold it. One of our biggest problems is we are prone to gossip. Lord, I feel it. And it's hard to learn this statements. Ready? These statements? Ready? You ready? You ready? <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. Were you there? Did you see it? No, but a reliable source told me. I've had people come up to me in 46 years of work. They said, Brother Don. So-and-so said, I said, it's probably two, but I want to know who so-and-so is. Well, uh, uh, he, he told it to me in confidence. Come on, did you get that? Yeah. He told it to me in confidence, and, and, and I just don't feel like it'd be the right thing to tell you who it was. I said, well, let me tell you something. God Almighty hates him that soweth discord. And if he sows discord... He has every right to be named. And I have every right to know who I'm supposed to forgive. And he choked. He said, well, uh, what? I said, I need to know who I'm supposed to forgive. 
That completely spun him. He couldn't figure that. You don't want to. Uh, it's a deadly sin to discord, gossip. It's deadly sin. I need to know who I'm supposed to forgive. Because you know what you're going to do now? You're going to cause me to wonder every place I go. Is that the joker that did that? Is that the knucklehead that said that? Is that the rat that said that? And I won't know who the rat is. But if I know who the rat is, and I go to my Lord and I say, God in heaven, you promised if, you, if I forgave that you'd forgive me. And that's what I want, God. I want to forgive him for sowing discord. I'm going to forgive him for, uh, uh, let's, let's use this example, if you will. In the early years, I only had 16 revival meetings a year. And one guy and one message blow two of them, 12 of them out the window. I ended up with four meetings that year. I preached on repentance. Linebacker behavior yourself. I preached on repentance. And you preach on repentance in the Baptist church, most of the time you get lynched. <laughs> well, I preached on repentance. And he got mad. I said the crowd in Galatians chapter 5 in the 19th verse are, are people who are lost without God. They live that lifestyle, they're lost. The saved folk are in Galatians 5.22. And he came up to me at the church, he said, I want you to know right now you're a heretic. I said, probably am. But I said, what you talking about? He said, the folks in Galatians 5.19 are just people that live in the flesh. I said, yeah, but if you're in the spirit, you don't live in the flesh. Amen. He said, but they're human people and they just make mistakes. I said, they don't deal with that. They deal with living like that. He said, preacher, what are you trying to tell me? Well, after he got done with all his junk, he called everybody that I was on my schedule and told them I was a heretic. And 12 of them jumped me. What'd you do, preacher? I just went to the street. I forgave him. Went to the street. Just start standing on the street corners preaching. Didn't have no meetings. Didn't have no money to go anywhere. So I just went to the street. Preached to the crowd. Amen. Later on, I seen him. He sheeped around in the meeting I was at. He came up to me and said, I need, to, I need to apologize to you. I said, for what? He said, well, I ruined you. I said, you didn't ruin nothing. He said, well, I need you to forgive me. I said, I did when I drove away. He said, what? I said, I did when I drove away. Amen. You mean I've been skirting you all this time for no reason? I said, exactly right. You wasted your time running for me. I done forgave you. Amen. You said, preacher, why you do that? That's control. Possess my vessel. You with me? Come on, you with me out there? Hang tight, hang tight. I'm going to read on here. Let me read on. Where am I at? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. That's where I'm at. But in all things are proven ourselves as the ministers of God. Now watch your Bible close. In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. Now gang, listen to me. If we're proving ourselves as ministers of God in all those ends, we're in control. That's what we got to be. We got to be a controlled vessel. Now let's watch and see how He helps us control ourselves by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Are you reading it with me? By the Word of Truth. By the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand, on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. Notice the switch. As deceivers, yet true, as unknown, yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. What's he saying? He's saying in these verses, my dear family, that, that when we get to the place where we control ourselves, we can be in all kinds of con, con problems and circumstances, but by these elements of God Almighty, it might look as if we're a ditch, but we're actually a mountaintop. It may look as if we're down and defeated, but we're actually climbing the heights. It may look like we ain't going to make it, 
But we already did at Calvary. Yeah. It may look like we can't possibly survive, but we got eternal life. Yeah. See, the world can't see us like we see us. Yeah. They look at us like we're nuts. Especially me. They look at us like we're out of our minds. But we're not out of our minds. We finally got our minds. Yeah. We were out of our minds and we was lost. Yeah. Now we're in our minds, amen, because God has saved us by His grace. Amen. So we spiritually have influence. Secondly, we separate ourselves. And thirdly, my dear family, verse 7, for God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. 2 Corinthians 7 says, let us cleanse ourselves. For the sake of time, I'm going to hurry. We clean ourselves up. Do we get dirty? Sure. You know the dirtiest part of you is not your feet? It's your mind. You know that? No, I'll put you my heart's dirty. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The dirtiest part of you and me is my mind, your mind. You know all that stuff that you learned before you found Christ? It's still in there. Every once in a while, stupid stuff surfaces. Every once you wake up with this, that, the other, this, that, and the other, this, that, and the other, you had no idea that that was even rolling around in there, but it was. Sights, sounds, things accomplished, things not accomplished, people, family, friends, foes, city streets, doors we knocked on. One of the most careful things I had to do, Brother Cherry in New Orleans, was when I went door knocking in the ghetto of New Orleans, to get the people to come to the park to eat. I had to be very careful when I knocked on the door not to look through the door. And we'll not explain no more than that. But I'm just telling you, sights, sounds, actions has all been recorded. <laughs> It's on the cloud. <laughs> and every once in a while, something will trigger. Something will punch the right button. And up it will come on the screen of my mind. How do you control that, preacher? Overcome evil with good. Can I say this because I love you? You'll never erase it. You just got to cover it up. Don't dwell on it. Don't hang on and say, boy, I, ooh, I, I remember that. Mm -mm. When it rises up in your mind, you say, whoa, Lord, help me now. Help. God in heaven, help me now. My mind's done went dirty again. God, please, God, please, God. I'm sorry. I don't want. I don't want to think about that. I want to think about that. I don't want to remember that, God. I don't want to remember that. You should preacher. What do you do then? You jump in that Bible. I mean, both feet kicking. You jump down in that Bible. Let us cleanse ourselves. You said, God in heaven. I want to cleanse myself. How do I cleanse myself, God? How does a young man cleanse his way? <laughs> See, you know what to do, right? Our problem is not we don't know what to do. Our problem is we don't do what we know. We don't control ourselves. We run wild and then beg God's grace to forgive us. It's a whole lot smarter to use grace to stay out of trouble than it is to get out of trouble. What does God say about this situation? Well, I don't know. Well, then don't do nothing till you find out. Amen. And do exactly what God Almighty tells you to do. Listen, to all through the Bible, all through, these things are written for our learning. Amen. According to the book of Romans, Amen. these things are written for our learning. Thank you, Lord. And when we read the Bible and apply the Bible, God, my dear family, calls us to holiness. And don't give me that fleshly excuse that you're human and you can't be holy. Because God made you holy when he saved you. Now, you and I have piled the dirt on top of the holiness ever since, but God made you holy when he saved you. 
You know what made you holy? Not your prayer. You know what made you holy? Not uh, turning over a new leaf. Not deciding to come to the house of God. Not deciding to obey the Lord and believers' baptism. That ain't what made you holy. You know what made you holy? The presence of God. Remember in Exodus chapter 3 and 4, Moses up on the mount. And God Almighty said, take them shoes off, now you're on the holy ground. Yeah. That ground wasn't holy until God came. Okay. Joshua chapter 5, he tells Joshua, take them shoes off, you're on holy ground. That's right. That ground wasn't holy until God came. Okay. If the presence of God made Moses' mountaintop and Joshua's piece of ground holy, what are you and I? What are you and I, brother? If the presence of God makes us holy, we are, are we not, the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. Come on, is that not right? Is that not right? The saved folk have an indwelling Holy Spirit in us, which makes us holy ground. The problem is the old nature is still around, and the old nature says, you ain't holy, you're a wicked devil. But you've got to get your mind and control this thing. So wait a minute. My old nature might be a wicked devil. My old nature may hate God. But my new nature loves Jesus. And the Holy Ghost inside of me is telling me how to do this, that, and the other. And the deal is, my friend, this. It ain't, ain't it got a thing to do with hate. What the deal is, you're trying to control me again, and I ain't going to let you do it. And you and I have every power in Christ Jesus to tell the enemy of our soul, go away. We resist him. He flees from us. And we can stand on holy ground in front of our God and say, God in heaven I want to be just like you he said I'm making you like me now chop 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 controlled vessel ready for the last part here it comes verse 9 is touching brotherly love you need not that I write unto you for yourselves are taught of God to love one another you know what we got to do to do this right we're going to have to love properly Lust ain't going to get it done. You got that? Lust ain't going to do it. All young people get married because they're lusting after each other. Love comes later. Love comes after a while. After, after a while, learning and, and understanding and, and trying to figure out and on and on and on. That's when love shows up. Not at first. That's why most of them don't make it five years. The lust wears off and they're finished. But love carries on. You old timers, if you really study it closely, you'll find out that you actually love each other more now than you thought you did at first. Sure, we changed. <laughs> You've seen my change in 21 years. Huh? You said, Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to, matter of fact, brotherly love. We're, we're taught of God to love one another. Now, I don't think there's anything like that in here, but God help you if you ain't controlling yourself in your love. Do you love somebody in here more than you love somebody else in here? Now, all of us love these babies. They're so cute and cuddly and neat. They're neat. Babies are just neat. Not in person. They're stinky and nasty and diaper ch uh, Bad. I'm talking about babies are just neat little people. They're little grown-ups learning how. And they need influence. They need mom and dad. They need, they, need, they need mom and dad. They need mom and dad. They need mom and dad. They need mom and dad to teach them how to live. Amen. You should preach what you're trying to tell me. The church, we need each other to account to each other. To, to, to love one another as, and prove to the world that we are the disciples of Christ. But dear family, if, if, we, don't, if we don't love properly, we'll choose sides. Well, I'm going to tell you to choose sides. 
You ready? You want to choose sides to stick it bad? I'm going to tell you to choose sides. You ready? Choose God's side. Choose God's side. Choose God's side. Choose God's side. It don't matter which vessel. You can love a piece of wood, same as you can love a piece of gold. You can love a chunk of clay, just the same as you can love a chunk of silver. So I'm going to let you choose sides. Means you're just prone to it. Choose God. You know why? God Almighty is not a respecter of persons. For God so loved. Come on now. He ain't willing in any parish. He wants all to come to repentance. He wants all to do right. He wants all to be his people. And that's the side you and I need to choose. Now we've done that. We've lived on earth. We've sanctified ourselves with spiritual influence. We've separated ourselves from that which God is not pleased with. We've cleaned ourselves up. We've learned how to love one another properly. Verse 12 says that you may walk honestly toward them or without, that you may have lack of nothing. Now we've got to deal with the lost. We have to be honest. We have to be honest with the lost that we'll deal with. We cannot be a phony baloney. We cannot be a hypocrite. You hear me, church? We cannot be a hypocrite. You say, why, preacher? Because lost folks can discern a hypocrite in two seconds. Dogs, babies, and street people. You hear me? You say, preacher, what do you say? Did you ever walk up to a dog and you're the nicest pie and his hair raises up on his teeth, gets very big? Why did he do that? There's a spirit about you he smells. Did you ever have the cutest little baby you ever seen in your life? He says, can I hold a baby? And just about the time you get that baby, he goes into a fit. And the next one comes up and grabs a gun and he just smiles and coos and slobbers all over everybody. What was the deal? He senses a spirit. It's not like that every single time. But I'm telling you, they can sense a spirit. Street people. I'd have folks come by to preach down there in them streets, and they'd all drive away after a while, and my boys would come up to me and say, Hey, Rev, Acton didn't love us. He didn't care nothing about us. He's just showing off over there. Now that he's shut up, would you please preach to us? I had a guy, this guy was absolutely the pit, so the pit of the pit of the pit. And he came up to me one day and he said, Rev, he said, do you really love us that much? I said, yes, sir, I sure do. He said, hardly anybody does because we're nasty. I said, ain't got nothing to do with me. I don't care what anybody else does. I want you saved. I want you to belong to God. You said, preacher, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you, you got to walk honest toward the withouts. Let us quit pretending. And now this. you got five more minutes? Five more minutes. That's it. Last night of the meeting, okay, five more minutes. Tomorrow's Saturday. You can sleep in if you want to. Five more minutes. Look at the last part of this chapter. We've lived our lives. We've been on earth however many years since salvation. And that's when life begins, by the way. Before salvation, there's nothing but existence and survival. That's it. But once salvation starts, now you're living. You didn't have a liver until Jesus put the Holy Ghost in you. Now you got a liver in you. But I want you to look now at the rest of the chapter. I'd not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That's any second now. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain. 
we've lived our lives all the way up to verse 13 and now we've tried to control to the best of our ability when we failed we, we, we confessed it and forsook it and found mercy and got right back up again yep. now we which are alive and remain we're caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord Amen. wherefore comfort one another with these words Controlled vessels. You know what he's going to do with them controlled vessels? He's going to bring us home. Yeah. Amen. Some call it heaven, but I call it home, the old songwriter said. Amen. One of these days, you're going to hear Brother Rich on the heaven piano. Amen. And Miss Mary going to be singing up there. Countless zillions of angels are going to be singing up there. You and I are going to be singing up there. None of one of us will be out of tune. That's right. okay. Not a one of us will be sour. I'll have a better voice then, not this old raspy thing I got tonight. I thank God He gave me voice enough for this message. But I'm telling you flat out, gang, all the vessels we've spoken about, Brother Bob, all the vessels we talked about for these last two weeks, all that comes down to this one. I was begging God, how, well, God in heaven, how do I close this thing? How do you shut this off? I mean, there's no shut off here. Right. I'm just going to stop, okay? There's no shut off. Come Sunday morning, the good brother from yonder, yonder, he's going to preach the morning service, preacher's going to preach Sunday school, then he's going to preach the Sunday night. Come on, you still, keep right on going, vessels. Keep right on going. No, they ain't going to preach on vessels. That was my department this time. God, don't come get us. I want to come back and do this again next year. I want to come back on Mother's Day next year and start this all over again. Amen. You said, preacher, what would hinder you? Jesus coming or I drop, whatever. But it all comes down. Come on, baby. What all comes down, all these nights, all these things we've talked about for these two weeks, these 14 messages, come down to this fact. Am I going to let God control my Christian life or am I going to let my religious views control my Christian life? Am I going to do what God Almighty says to do as a vessel of honor or am I going to bring shame to my Savior? Am I going to, am I going to be an asset to this great church in the great house or vessels? Am I going to be an asset here Especially in this great ten transition, am I, am I going to be a, a hindrance? Am I going to be a stumbling block? Am I going to be, am I going to be one that, that when I come in, people say, praise the Lord? Or am I going to be one that comes in and they're going to go, oh, no. All of it, little Monica, all of it is in our control. We can be what we want to be in love with God. I can be holy or un. I can be pure or un. I can be right or wrong. Listen, I'm not a puppet. I'm not a robot. God Almighty hands choice out to me and says, listen, this is Christian life. This is what I, my book says. You make the choice. Remember now, you're coming home to judgment. What you choose to do, you're going to face. Well, did not Moses look at Israel one day and say, choose life. I set before you life. Choose life. And I set before this great church, choose to be a controlled vessel, an asset, a blessing to all that are around you. Starting with God, working your way through your house, and then bring your house to church and be a blessing to this great work. You with me? Yes. 